Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are looking at the US debt ceiling and other things, a bit of political fracturing going on. Of course, we've got a presidential uh, candidacy race about to commence and global uncertainty, all important things that can affect markets. So make sure you take plenty of notes, but as always, do make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to the Swiss Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my off-sider and co-host, Mitchell Laurentiel. Good to be here, Mr. Baxter. Thank you very much for having me. Now, as traders of the stock market that we are, we absolutely love uncertainty. I'm only kidding. We hate uncertainty, of course, long does the entire market. However, there's plenty of it at the moment. And in particular, when we talk about the US, plenty of political challenges as well as economic challenges, which we're going to dive into today. Indeed, there's a lot going on, and I think you know we're in for some volatile times. I think there's trouble coming over the hill, and I hate to be the boy that cried wolf. Um, that's not my mo, and it's certainly not fear mongering either. It's a, a, I think a lack of acknowledgement from markets, as we've seen all year, uh, as to some of the risks that sit out there in the in the world of unknown, uh, and the the, uh, the impact that they can most certainly have on what is still you know a reasonably overpriced equity market. It's a bit of a weird situation at the moment, totally, mm. and there's probably one headline that comes to mind first and foremost for me that's been dominating the last few weeks and that's the US debt ceiling. Mm. Not the first time we've been here as a point of note but what are your thoughts on the current situation? Look I mean it's a shambles uh, and um, I know we've spoken previously that you know governments you've got to try and measure your budget in and, and balance it out. Well, that's all gone out the window. We'll just print some more money uh, and it doesn't matter. Somebody else will be paying. Uh, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a requirement by uh, constitution in the US. If the US wants to increase the level of government debt that it carries, it has to go through Congress. And Congress at the moment is controlled by the Republicans. Uh, they've, uh, they've had a, a new speaker that was appointed you know, only a number of weeks ago. Very difficult job getting appointed as speaker. And, and, and let me be really clear, speaker of the House in the US is a very, very significant role. Uh, it's actually the third most per- powerful person in terms of public office in, in, in the US okay. after the president and vice president. So it's a significant role. The incumbent took a real job, uh, you know, a lot of backdoor deals to get across the line and get in. Uh, and uh, and that all really came unraveled this week. Um, and uh, he's been uh, pulled aside and stood down. Uh, and there's a lot of political infighting going on. And, and, and this is at a time when you've got an economy which has been sailing along beautifully. The Fed have done an incredible job of, dare I say, threading the needle. Um, it's not even a soft landing. It's a, it's a, it's no a, landing it's at almost, all. It's almost, this sort of language is almost sort of Donald Trump-esque, but it's, it's been a beautiful, it's a beautiful <laughs> outcome for the, uh, uh, for the economy so far. And this is the sort of thing that can derail it because yeah, if, if there is a government sh- sh- shutdown because there's no money to pay wages, and this has happened before, this isn't something that's out of left field, um, you know, about 0.2 percent per week off GDP. So it's something you want to get resolved fairly quickly because it does impact on on the economy. 0.2 percent per week. When you look at the scale of the actual dollars of what that would be, that would be trillions of dollars per week, right? Shaped off the economy is, is, is substantial. So something needs to get sorted out. And how do you sort of out? You just roll over and go, okay, let's get into a bit of horse trading. Uh, you give us this, and we'll do that. Or, or do you finally grab it by the scruff of the neck and go, this whole economic policy of, of, of just printing more money to provide more subsidy and ineffective use of capital has to stop? Um, you know, who's the person to do that? I don't know. I don't think anyone's really put their hand up to, to, to show who they are. Uh, and it's a, it's a millstone now. It also calls into question, of course, you know, the US dollar uh, in its current role as the world's US reserve, uh, the world's reserve currency. What's its future look like when it's just, oh, we'll just keep printing more money. Who are you going to sell the bonds to? I mean, yields are reasonably high, so they're quite attractive right now, 5% for two years. But who's a buyer? Who wants to be long US dollars when you've got an exchange rate that's relatively strong, certainly is against the Aussie? You've also got interest rates that have risen, but they're probably not going to be going up. I don't know if they're going to be going up any further. They're probably staying where they're at. Yeah. Um, but what's the driver then for, for further strength in the US dollar? So you end up buying an asset that's you know quite possibly a depreciating currency, not the smartest move. So you know that, that's a major factor. It'll get pushed through. There'll be a trade-off in some way, shape or form. Uh, but it just sort of really highlights the... The fiasco, I think, is probably the best term to describe you know, the US political environment right now. Uh, and we haven't even started the, 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 the comedy of comedies, which is, of course, the, uh, the presidential race, which starts in November. Well, can we talk to that now, AB? Mm. So US debt ceiling, it's likely that they'll, they'll raise that, as they always do, for the mm. most part. In terms of picking a candidate to run the well, free world. I mean, if you've got an opportunity to pull the chain on an incumbent president who's 
been demonstrably useless across most metrics. This is because the Republicans have the control of Congress, right? Mm, they do, but they're arguing with each other. So rather right. than shining a light on the inadequacies of the current current presidency and administration, now all the highlight is, of course, on the infighting within the Republican Party. So it's a real Silly. step up from a political perspective. But, you know, do you pull the chain and go, enough's enough, this, this flawed economic policy of having an open border, um, of forgiving student debt, um, of, of, of introducing things like the Inflation Reduction Act by depleting your strategic reserves of petroleum, only to see oil prices almost double uh, from what you were expecting to have to buy it back at. It makes no sense. And, you know, do you just accept that there is no sense to what's going on and just roll with it? Or do you go, this is enough, we've got to pull it back? It's also going to affect aid for countries like the Ukraine. Um, you know, and at a time when we've got, you know, really massive, I'm sure we'll talk about this, really massive um uncertainty from a geopolitical perspective. You know, the war in Ukraine now is 18 months in, uh, but now we're seeing things, for example, in Israel uh, uh, with uh, with uh, the Gaza Strip attacks uh, over the weekend, or you know, in Bosnia we've got some some tension there. So it's not a it's not a steady ship right now. Which, uh, yeah, I don't know. Interesting time. It's going to take a pretty good captain to steward that. So if we talk about presidential election, because this is this was this almost makes me laugh. It's quite funny. Uh, in terms of the candidates, we could be seeing a return of former President Donald Trump versus now Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. What's your thoughts on where that could lead? Yeah, it's not exactly sort of Tyson Holofield too, is no. it? It's, uh, it's uh, blind leading the blind. It's, it's a, a very very sad indictment of things, and and you know you've got a, an incumbent president, and normally people don't run against the incumbent president, but given given the demonstrable lack of mental acuity that that President Biden's suffering with, and probably was before he was elected, in all fairness. And that's not really offset or counterbalanced by a vice president that's capable of much other than giggling. Um, you know, the door's got to be open to somebody else to step in there. Uh, and this is actually an interesting story. Uh, I'm not one for conspiracy theorists uh, type stuff at all. Um, RFK, so Robert Kennedy's son, RFK Jr., uh, the nephew of John F. Kennedy, of course, president was assassinated. Um, he's running. He's polling quite strongly. I think 18% were the numbers he was pulling down. Uh, and, and to this point in time, the Biden administration uh, and the branch of, uh, of government, the deep government that no one knows who does what, um, aren't offering him uh, Secret Service protection. So you've got someone whose uncle and father were both assassinated very publicly, who's the strongest polling candidate in the Democratic Party, and he's not being given any Secret Service bodyguard or security uh, stuff at all at the moment because the optics, the optics don't look good because it looks like, okay, this is the heir apparent with the with the security detail around him. And, and you know, to that end, I, I picked up something the other day where they, they reckon there's some fairly credible threats uh, against President, or oh, former President Trump as well. So it'd be a, a tragedy if that's where democracy finishes, you know, with an assassin's rifle or something similar. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But uh, it's a basket case. Uh, a, a, an absolute basket case, which, you know, for the world's largest economy and, and the one that we trade and invest in, it makes it all the more peculiar that volatility is so low right now. Uh, you know, and, and markets are you know, looking still pretty, pretty fully valued. I know we've had a bit of a sell off, but uh, it looks pretty fully valued. So politically speaking, we're dealing with the US debt ceiling as well as fractured parties and, and a lot of trouble there. What about economically speaking? Let's talk about inflation because we did see a significant reduction in inflation mm. last couple of months, a small little uptick. And then we've seen bond yields ratchet up higher, pricing in higher for longer. Not necessarily, mm. as you say, another rise, but mm. higher current rates for longer. Yeah. Services inflation and then oil prices the last three months have been pretty strong. Absolutely. And, and the oil price issue you know, is, is a major factor. And, and that's one where... You know, if you think about OPEC and its influence on the ability uh, to, to legitimately, through its legal cartel, manipulate oil prices to whatever level it really wants, um, it, it is a major factor. It's also a major contributor to inflation. We've talked about this previously. You know, everything has a component of oil to it. You know, whether it's transport, whether it's air conditioning and refrigeration, whether it's the clothes you wear, whatever it might be, there's a there's a there's an input from oil prices there. So it does have very very long tentacles. Uh, and we have seen that ratchet up quite significantly uh, in oil prices, which is starting to kick back into um, being uh, yeah, uh, PMI and manufacturing uh, inflation, which will then flow through to prices on the other end for the consumer. So I don't think they're out of the woods from an inflationary perspective. Um, it's chipped down, but we've alluded to this previously, you know, that hardcore inflation is kind of like a, a, a barnacle on a rock, you know, you really got to 
go pretty well to smash it off. And, you know, it's going to be a while to do that. Interest rates aren't going to be coming down anytime soon in the US. Um, you know, we thought maybe second quarter next year, but that might even be pushing back a little further now, I think. So, you know, you've got people having to deal with a higher cost of borrowing, which of course affects consumer spending uh, because mortgage rates for some people are higher. A lot of people on fixed rates, of course, in the US, like 30 year fixed, but different to Australia, uh, but it does weigh heavily. Absolutely. Weighs heavily on business too, because you can't borrow to invest uh, or, or improve your processes because your cost of borrowing is has ratcheted up quite significantly too. So, totally. So, you know, there's a, there's a, and if you are borrowing, then it's a higher cost of service, which then affects your profitability. So it, it, it is a, a negative. You'd like to see those rates start to grind down, but while there's inflation, that's unlikely to happen. So with that, AB, if we talk about maybe a result, so you've spoken about volatility potentially mm. picking up. Earnings for US, we're about to go into earnings season at the time. It runs so quickly, doesn't it? Hey, Every like, three months, right? Yeah. So we've got a lot to deal with at the moment. Earnings season, see, quite interesting. The expectations at the time of this podcast right now are pretty much flat. So mm. not no growth, but no loss either, mm. just flat. What are your thoughts? On current, uh, uh, flat against previous earnings, basically, which was yeah. a decline, so no real That's change. Right. So yeah. it's interesting, you can window dress, you can put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. Uh, <laughs> that's the reality of it. And yeah, we've had declining earnings, just because earnings haven't declined as much as people are expecting, that's been seen as a positive. It's not, you need to see genuine earnings growth in a flat line earnings quarter. Um, again, questions you know, the level that some of these stocks are trading at. Um, you know, a lot of companies, particularly the the, the the giga caps, they've been boosted by things like AI. Um, we've talked previously about NVIDIA, for example, that's yep. been all about AI. Um, they're going to have to start showing some signs of revenue as a consequence of that rather than oh, at some point, somewhere down the line, earnings are going to boost up on the back of AI. People are going to get to the point where they probably want to start seeing it fairly shortly. And if you get another quarter where there's no real discernible impact on the bottom line, um, that story is maybe just dare I say it, fake news and, and not maybe impacting uh, on the business in quite the way uh, that investors may have thought. So, you know, if earnings look a little bit shaky, you know, you can expect, um, you know, a really, really difficult market, certainly a volatile market. Although, you know, the last few earnings seasons that we've had, even when numbers have been pretty disappointed, markets have moved higher, which reflects that irrational um, disconnect between, you know, what's going on and, and the exuberance of markets. Speaking of irrational, if we move, we've gone politics mm -hmm. within the U.S., economics and then now let's go to geopolitics mm. recent war uh, in israel mm. i mean this is just crazy right in terms of yeah. what's happened what kind of effect could that have on markets in your opinion look initially i, I don't think a great effect you might see a little bit of volatility in like oil prices for example and again you know we're coming at you live you know this is stuff that happened without dating the podcast literally yesterday so, you know, think things can move around quite a bit before this goes to air. And if you're consuming this down the line, then, you know, it was at a point in time. Yeah, I think we saw, we'll see a little bit of a move in oil prices always because it's Middle East, risk on. Uh, and you might see a little bit of a, a push higher in oil prices there, which, again, not great for the US from an inflationary perspective. That's right, or the rest of the world for that um, but I think, you know, Israel's a fairly small part of the global economy, as is Palestine. So, you know, having a crack at each other on that level, um, I don't think it's going to be any any major impact economically. Where it starts to get more serious is if this is more prolonged or they become further sustained attacks down the line. And then the bigger nations, the US backstops uh, Israel, which is more than likely to happen. Um, and then things have got the capacity to go the other way because you might have other Middle Eastern countries which are then siding with Palestine and, and, and all of a sudden everything is back to the topsy-turvy um, topsy -turvy world of, uh, of five or six years ago before uh, before President Trump got those Middle Eastern uh, accords signed, the Abrahams uh, accords signed up. You know, we might be back to that pre-peace agreement uh, stuff. Uh, and it's interesting timing. You wonder what the US is actually going to do about it because it's perceived as being pretty weak right now. And I can't say that that's probably uh, not a coincidence that you know, Hamas chose you know, weaker looking US to, to launch attacks, knowing that the US will always backstop Israel. So no, it's, it, it, it's an interesting one. It's, it, it's just sad that, you know, that it's, it's civilian population that, 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 that the people ultimately that suffer on both sides. 
um, with with something like this, and it doesn't. It really doesn't have to be that way. Uh, but you know, we're regressing, and and it's game on. And I, and I think you know, just like the war on the Ukraine, you know, the, what impact is that having on the global economy now? Eh, not really that much because yeah. it's just become accepted uh, that there's there's a war, uh, and terrible as it is, it's 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 not front and center. It's become normalized. Yeah. As opposed to, oh gosh, you know, there's a war, and you wanted to consume every bit of information you can find. It's like, oh, it's still going. Yeah, you know, gotcha. so yeah, that fades fairly quickly. Um, let's hope that this one is something that can be resolved with some political um, oversight, as opposed to yeah, you know, more full scale military operations. Indeed, plenty of challenges in the US. I don't think there's any off the top of my head. Any final ones before we wrap up today, AB? Look, you've got migration, which is a, a massive issue, uh, which again is going to be an electoral. Um, time bomb, I think, for the Democrats insofar as, you know, they've now had to go the 180 where they're, oh, no, we're going to start rebuilding the wall. Oh, the wall. Yeah. It's back. It's like a Pink Floyd uh, music video. The wall is back. And, um, you know, it was, it was, no, we'd never do that. We want you to come. And that's like, actually, no, we don't. So, yeah, we will put that up. And, you yeah, know, that, again, um, that sort of flick flack type of policy is not what's needed in the world right now. We need strong leadership that's got vision. And, and isn't messing around in the fiddling around on the minor stuff and majoring in minor things, actually looking at, okay, this is where we could be if we had a little bit of focus. And who knows who's going to win the race to the White House, but hopefully it's someone that does have um, you know, a little bit of a um, um, little bit of vision, and I have to say, you know, Ramaswamy. I, I actually think out of all the candidates I've seen so far, probably offers that in that. You know, it's about re-establishing a, a core value system and building from there. Just like if you're building a business, if you've got a vision and values, everything falls off it. But when it's just uh, you get sort of embroiled in day to day and lose track of, you know, what what are you doing this for? What's the big vision? Uh, becomes all a bit you know, counterproductive. So certainly very interesting times. And I, I just don't know that this market's really priced all of this um, diatribe in. I know we've just sort of been flicking and flacking through some of the sort of headlines that are out there at the minute, um, but market's certainly are pricing this in right now. And, and perhaps it is an opportunity to buy into some volatility uh, ahead of what we've, uh, we've got coming ahead. ETFs, UVXY, if, you, uh, if you've got the stomach for it, or Vixi, uh, the ungeared version, uh, probably two good places to go, or maybe buy some buy some options on, on the VIX index in itself. New uh, one too, by the way, mm. SVXY. So it's actually 0.5 geared. So it, it moves Ooh. half as much as the VIX yeah. does on an intraday basis. Great covered call instrument for volatility. SVXY. SVXY, the nano trade. Yeah, I like that's it. right. Let's uh, take a bit of the sting out of it. And, you know, and, and again, these are... Your portfolio of strategies. So if, you, if you've got to the end of this, and I do appreciate we probably bumped around a little bit with some of the things that we've talked to. Um, you know, if you're running a self-managed super, particularly, these are things that you can do to hedge out some of the risk. And it's important to do that in these times. Uh, and, and, and maybe something like SVXY might be uh, a palatable way for you to do that without uh, cleaning your nostrils up. That's right. Absolutely, AB. Thank you very much for your advice today. Absolute pleasure. Anytime, Mitch. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit that notification button. And we'll look forward to hosting you next week.